Well, good morning. For those of you who are back with us once again, uh, you've been joining us in the past for our previous lessons, our previous worship services. I want to say welcome to each one of you, to our members here at Congregation at Rush Springs. Uh, uh, some of you we got to see last Sunday night as uh, several of the members uh, drove around and did kind of some sidewalk singing for some of our older members and shut-ins and all, so it was good to kind of see you even though it was at a distance, you know, practicing the, the social distancing rules, but uh, getting to, to see you in person was uh, such a, a blessing for us, and hopefully it was for those of you that we were able to to, to, to visit with and sing a couple songs for, and uh, others of you that maybe we didn't get to uh, last Sunday night, uh, plans are to, to do it again, maybe try to get to you soon. Uh, of course, obviously, with some of the restrictions being lifted here in the next week or two, uh, hopefully we'll get to a point where uh, maybe we can resume having uh, some worship services in person uh, here at the building, and so we'll be getting some more information to you about that. Uh, for those of you maybe are joining us for the first time, uh, who are members here or maybe outside this congregation, members of this community here in Rush Springs, or maybe in other parts of the country or other parts of the world, you know, wherever you may be, we want to welcome you here this morning. We're thankful that you're joining us in this online worship service as we still try to worship and serve God during this this pandemic uh, during this this time of, of crisis, and so uh, we're thankful for the technology uh, that enables us to do so. And as always, thanks to, uh, to Kevin Worden for helping to uh, to produce this and do the recordings for us for Facebook Live and for YouTube. Also, I want to say thank you to Lisa Foster, uh, who does a lot of the work on our Facebook page. She has been posting some of the slides, uh, announcing our lessons and different things. And, uh, usually on a daily basis, she'll uh, either post a, a scripture text or maybe a song or things like that, some words of encouragement. So appreciate her doing that. So uh, once again, welcome. Uh, glad that you're with us here this morning. Uh, and so we want to uh, continue with part two here in just a few moments of our lesson about leadership. And of course, leadership, uh, we need to understand that to be a true leader, we need to be a servant. And so leadership is actually serving others. Uh, last week in part one, we looked at seven motivations for being a servant, reasons why we should want to serve. And so this week, we're going to look at some, some characteristics, uh, some, some traits, uh, some uh, things that we would uh, say, well, yeah, that, that, is, that is who a true leader, that, that's who a servant is, that, that defines them. And so we'll look at these characteristics this week and try to learn more about how God wants us to serve others. Uh, and by serving others, uh, we are serving him. We'll start off with a song. So if you know this song, want like to join in. Uh, if you don't know it, uh, hopefully you can uh, kind of pick up as we go along and uh, learn the words as we have them here on the screen and then the music in the background.
this morning's lesson, let's go to our Father in prayer. Father, we're so thankful for another beautiful day that you have bestowed upon us. We're so thankful for all the blessings that you have given us. Father, this time as we're entering into this time of worship, we pray that everything that's done here this morning will be acceptable in your sight and will be pleased with our efforts, Father. And as we worship you, even though we may be in our homes and in separate places and not together as your body in, in one place and in the building, we uh, still are mindful of the fact that we are to worship you in spirit and in truth. And may we put aside the thoughts of, of worldly things and the cares and the worries of this world and focus on you for a few moments this morning. And again, may we provide a worship service that's, that's pleasing to you, Father, that it may build us up, may strengthen us, and encourage us, Father. Father, we ask this time you be with those who are in need of our prayers, and should be with those who are making decisions concerning the uh, pandemic, be with leaders of our nation, be with our state leaders, Father. As you be with the doctors, the nurses, first responders, all those who are working to try to treat those who are ill and to uh, try to prevent the spread of, of this disease, Father. Father, we ask you to continue to, to bless us. Uh, so thankful for all that you've provided for us. Thankful most of all for your son Jesus, his love for us. We're thankful for your word. Thankful for uh, your church, the kingdom, Father. And just so thankful for all of the physical and spiritual blessings that you've given us. Father, we ask that you would forgive us when we sin and fall short. We know that we don't always uh, live up to the expectations. We just ask that we would be forgiven for those transgressions, Father, and in the, in the end, we may hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And ask all these things in Christ's holy and blessed name. Amen. As we said in the introduction, and uh, leading up to this lesson from last week, uh, we're going to continue in part two, and today we're looking at nine characteristics of a servant. As we said, some, some traits, uh, some uh, some, some characteristics, you know, what, what would be the definition of a leader, uh, things that would help to uh, make us to recognize someone who is a true leader and someone who, uh, as we saw last week, who wants to be a leader in following the example of Christ, uh, we must learn to be a servant. You know, true leaders serve others. You know, some people have the misconception that being the leader means well, you're in charge, uh, you're the head honcho, you get to make all the decisions, you get to, get to give the orders, you get to tell everybody what to do, and then, then they've got to do it. And That's not necessarily the, uh, the true definition of a leader. Uh, we understand that the, the, the best leaders lead by example, and, and Christ was the best example in showing us how to lead by serving others. And we looked at the example at the end of last week's lesson there in John chapter 13 of Christ being a servant uh, and washing uh, the feet of the, the apostles. And, uh, and there were many other instances during his ministry where he showed that to be a, a true leader, uh, we need to serve others and look to the needs of others. So let's look at some of these characteristics this morning. Uh, the verses that we used to introduce the lessons uh, last week, uh, we'll go over these right quick. Matthew chapter 20, uh, beginning verse 26. Uh, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Uh, Christ is telling the apostles this uh, in response to their questions, you know, and, and kind of the, the wrangling and, and the shuffling amongst them, you know, who is the greatest of the apostles? Is, is their meeting here as they are partaking of the Last Supper, is as Christ is about to be uh, crucified, and, you know, they, they all want to be at the top. They want to be number one. They want to be the greatest. And, and he's explaining to them, you know, if you want to be great, then you have to, uh, you have to humble yourself. You have to, you know, not think of yourself at the, at the top of the pedestal. You've got to be down at the bottom and, and be, uh, you know, the least among those uh, that are around them. You know, let you know, be a slave, just as the Son of Man, just as Christ did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life a ransom for many. In the passage in Luke chapter 22, if you were with us last week, you remember this was when James and John's mother was coming to Christ. And she's wanting some special recognition for her two sons. She wants them to be on his right and left hand, uh, wants them to, to be right there in this place of prominence with Christ. And, and he said, hey, not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And, of course, we know that oftentimes, uh, you know, the younger brothers or sisters, you know, the younger siblings, you know, the younger people in a group uh, are seen as, 
you know, down the totem pole, so to speak. You know, usually it's the older people, the more experienced that, that are recognized as those who should be the leaders. But he says, you know, be like the younger, be as the younger ones, and he who governs as he who serves. Uh, so Christ is explaining that it's not all about being at the top. It's not about the recognition. It's about the service uh, that we do to others. And he goes on to say, for who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. So again, Christ is explaining the importance of, of service and, and doing good for others, not just being the one who gets the recognition. So uh, let's think about that as we go into these nine characteristics of a servant. Well, first of all, a servant is totally dedicated to God's service. Well, 119, uh, 119th Psalm, verse 10, uh, David says, With my whole heart I have sought you. And so David is explaining that he, he doesn't have a divided heart. He doesn't have divided uh, priorities. Uh, he doesn't have one foot uh, in God's word or uh, today you know, people have one foot in the kingdom and then still one foot in the world. Uh, David does not want to divide his attention. He doesn't want to divide his, his focus. Uh, he's asking for God to bless him so that he does not wander from his commandments. And so we think about uh, these verses here about being totally dedicated to God's service. Uh, we think about a servant. Uh, we think about a, a slave. Uh, in Romans uh, chapter 1, we get to just a second, talk a little bit more. You know, Paul describing himself as a slave. Uh, going on there in, uh, in Psalms chapter 86, or the 86th Psalm, verse 11, uh, the New International Version, David says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart. So as we talked about a minute ago, uh, it's not divided attention. It's not divided focus. Uh, it's, it's, one, it's a one-track mind. It's a one-track heart focusing on God uh, that he may fear his name. And so again, thinking about the, uh, the ideas, as Paul said there in, in Romans chapter 1, that he describes himself as a, a, a slave. Some versions will say servant, but some, some versions will, will call him, he refers to himself as a slave to Christ. Well, a slave doesn't have divided loyalties. A slave doesn't have divided attention. Uh, it's focused on that one purpose. Next, a real servant sees service as an opportunity, not an obligation. As sometimes, uh, as in our, in our common speak, uh, sometimes as we're, we're talking to family or friends or whatnot, and, and we've discussed this before in our, our Bible classes or maybe in lessons, but you know, we need to kind of maybe take a little bit more thought, a little bit more care in, in the words that we use. Uh, not necessarily meaning anything by how it's said, but again, just the, the connotation where we talk about, you know, come on, let's get ready. It's, it's, we've got to go to church. Uh, we have to go to church. Come on, let's go. Let's get around. You know, well, do, do we have to or do we, do we get to? Uh, do we see it as an opportunity to serve God? And of course, as we talked about last week, as we mentioned a few moments ago, uh, by serving others, we are in fact serving God uh, in Matthew chapter 25. So do we see these opportunities as just that. Uh, do we see an opportunity to serve others as an opportunity, not an obligation? Don't see it as, well, we have to go do this. We have to go visit those that are sick, or we have to go uh, take care of those who maybe uh, are hungry, or maybe those that have uh, lost a house to uh, to a fire, or of course, this time of year with the storms. Um, you know, many of us uh, nearly missed you know some some serious damage the other night uh, from some of the storms that rolled through. But but if that was the case, you know, do we see an opportunity to help maybe clean up limbs or to clean up some damage? And well, I've got to go do that because that's what God expects me to do. You know, don't look at it like that. See it as an opportunity, not an obligation. Staying there in Psalms this time in the one hundredth Psalm, uh, David says, "Serve the Lord with gladness." We ought to be happy. We we ought to be excited that we get an opportunity to serve God. Come before his presence with singing. Well, usually you don't sing when you're upset or downtrodden. Uh, maybe some do to try to, to try to cheer themselves up. But usually you're singing when you're happy and you, you know, you're, you're excited. And so that thought, you'll serve God and you come before his presence with singing. So have the right attitude, have the, uh, the right, right focus and the right frame of mind, seeing opportunities to serve as just that, opportunities, not obligations. 1 Timothy chapter 1, English Standard Version, verse 12 says, I thank him who has given me strength. And this is Paul uh, talking about Christ Jesus giving him the strength because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Now, Paul's getting a second chance. He says, formerly, you know, previously in his life, he was a blasphemer, a persecutor. He was an insolent opponent. He opposed Christ. 
those who were Christians, he was persecuting them. He was throwing them in prison. He was uh, an accomplice to, uh, to their murder. Uh, he was there when Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned. And so he, he had done all this that was wrong to Christ. But he's getting that second chance. And he says, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. But he's thankful for that second chance and thankful for the opportunity that he has given. So we need to have that same frame of mind. Next, a servant is motiva motivated excuse me, by what God thinks, not what others think or what, what man thinks. So, so what does God think about our service? What does, what does God think about our efforts? Not what other people may think. Well, Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, for am I seeking the approval of men or are we looking to get the pat on the back from them? Are we looking to get that good job, you know, what way to go? Is that who we're trying to please or are we looking to, uh, to get man's approval? Or are we looking to get approval from God? Do, do we want to please God? And will, will he be pleased with our efforts? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. So this kind of goes back a little bit into this idea we talked about in the, in the first point. Uh, you know, our, our loyalties can't be divided. Okay? We can't uh, be trying to uh, do one for one side and, and, and do something for the other. You know, do for God and do for the world. We can't try to please God and try to please the world at the same time because that just doesn't mix. Okay, We have to be seeking to please God and Him fully and not worry about what the world thinks because as the world has, has changed, as the world continues to change, you know, the idea of living a faithful Christian life and doing the things that are expected of being a faithful Christian, it doesn't match up with what much of the world thinks. Uh, you know, much of the world uh, would, would oppose you know, what we believe as Christians and, and what we try to do as Christians. Uh, it doesn't follow uh, you know, their, their mainstream ideas or what they would like the mainstream to be. And so, again, uh, we can't worry about what others think, what others say uh, about what we're doing. We have to consider what God thinks. And so that, that's, that's a characteristic of a servant. We need to be motivated what God thinks of our, our service, not what others think. Next. A servant does not judge other service. You know, sometimes it's easy to look at what others are doing and uh, may say, well, I'm, I'm doing good compared to them or try to build ourselves up according to what others are or, or maybe are not doing. Romans chapter 14, verse 4 says, Who are you to judge another servant? To his own master he stands or falls. You know, if you had some servants in your home and then your neighbor had servants as well, you, know, you can't look at your neighbor and his servants and say, well, you know, they don't do a good job. Uh, they, they, they don't do what they're supposed to. Well, that, that's not up to you to judge. To your neighbor, if his servants are doing what he wants, if they're uh, living up to the standard that he has set, he's pleased with their efforts, then that's fine with him. And it's his position to judge, not us to judge someone else. And so uh, we understand the, the example that's being set here. So we can't judge what others are doing. Uh, we have to worry about ourselves. Uh, it says he will, we will be made to stand for God is able to make him stand. So uh, we have to live up to our own standards, uh, to, to our own master's standards. Uh, when we talk about judging, a lot of people uh, want to instantly turn to Matthew chapter 7 as Christ is kind of concluding his Sermon on the Mount. And many people in the world today, they want to jump on these first few verses, 1 through 5 of chapter 7. Well, it says in the Bible, you know, judge not lest you be judged. So these people who don't live according to the Bible, they live these worldly ways, whether it's alternative lifestyles or in other uh, areas of sin. Well, you know, Christians are hypocritical. You know, they're told in the Bible not to judge others, and here they are judging the way I live and saying I'm wrong. Well, obviously that verse is taken out of context because even though it says judge not lest you be judged, it's talking about uh, judging uh, the outward appearance and, and, and judging not having the, the whole story, not understanding maybe all of these circumstances sometimes. Uh, of course, again, we're, most of us are familiar with this, this thought that's provided. You know, how can we see the speck, the splinter, the, the moat, uh, as some versions say, that's in our neighbor's eye when we've got this huge beam sticking out of our own? You know, we, we need to look at our own faults, our own shortcomings, before we look to criticizing others and trying to point out their wrong. Now, for those who say, well, the Bible tells us we're not supposed to judge. Well, you turn over to John chapter 7, and we're told to judge with righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 5 uh, talks about us judging those unfruitful works. Uh, uh, Cliff Warhan, a uh, former preacher here at Rush Spring, you know, he always talked about being a, you know, we should be fruit inspectors. Uh, we need to look at 
those around us and to see how they're living. And, and of course, if for their fellow Christians uh, with a, 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 an attitude of care and concern and love, uh, and if they are sinning, if they have shortcomings in their life, uh, try to help them to recognize that so that they can uh, repent of those sins and to better their lives. But again, uh, we have a responsibility to judge, uh, but judging with righteous judgment. But we can't judge other servants and say, well, they're not doing a good enough job or, or other things. We don't know the circumstances. We don't know the conditions surrounding their service. Uh, we think of the story of the, uh, the widow who was giving her offering, and she gave just the, the two mites, just, just pennies, basically, to us today. And the, the disciples were looking at us, well, she just gave pennies. She didn't, she didn't give anything. She didn't, didn't give much. Uh, but Christ explains to them, you know, she gave more than what you gave because she gave everything she had because she was poor. She only had those few mites, but she gave everything she had. So they were judging her service and not understanding the, the, the full circumstances and the situation. So we need to be cautious and not to judge other service. Next, a servant gives the credit to God. You know, a lot of people are always looking for that pat on the back, uh, pat on the back looking for uh, the recognition, uh, looking to say, yeah, look, 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 look what they're doing. You know, they just, you know give them, uh, give them the, the applause, give them the, uh, the, the credit for, for what they're doing. Well, it, it's not about us. Uh, it's not about what we can do. I need to understand that we're given talents. We're given abilities by God. Uh, we're blessed with those things. It's, it's not anything we have uh, inherently inside of us. It's not something that we've done, whatever talent it may be, uh, whether it's some great athlete or someone like that. You know, God has given them those talents. God has given them those blessings. Now, yes, they may have worked hard. Uh, they may have honed those talents and they've, 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 they've worked out and, and practiced and, and done what they could to make those talents even better. But when it comes down to it, God has given them those blessings. And of course, you'll see a lot of athletes that will give the credit to God for those opportunities, for those talents, for those blessings. Uh, others you know, may not publicly, uh, maybe don't mean anything by it. I uh, don't think maybe to, to include God, but, uh, but when it comes down to it, it's, it's, it's God doing for us. And it's, it's not about us, you know, what we've done. It's, it's not about, you know, what, what we're doing. First Peter chapter four, verses 10 and 11. The English Standard Version says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks as oracles of God. You know, so when we speak, this is God's word. It's, it's not what Darren Brantley's saying or any other preacher or teacher. So it, it's not our own doings. We're just spreading. We're, we're preaching. We're teaching God's word. So what we're preaching comes from God. God gets the credit for that. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. God gives us the abilities, gives us the talents to do what we can to serve others. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So it's not you know, what's in it for me. We don't do it for ourselves or don't look for the, the credit, don't look for the attention, don't look for the, you know, the newspaper headlines, you know, look what so-and-so has done because it, it's all about us. It's just not what's in it for me. And some of you are familiar with the, the movie Field of Dreams, one of my favorite movies. Uh, if you know the, the storyline, uh, Ray Kinsella is uh, getting... Uh, instructions to build a baseball field out of his cornfield. So he goes out and plows under his cornfield there in Iowa, builds this baseball field, and the ghost of Shoeless Joe Jackson and then some of the other baseball players uh, from the, the early part of the 20th century come back, and every afternoon they're playing baseball games on Ray Kinsella's Field of Dreams. And one day, uh, Shoeless Joe invites Terrence Mann, who's the character played by James Earl Jones, uh, he invites him to come out to the outfield, to the cornfield, with the rest of their players after the game. And so uh, he's about to go with them, and Ray asks him, you know, am I not invited? You know, I, I want to go. I want to see what's out there. You know, that, that's my cornfield. And Shoeless Joe says, well, you're not invited. And Ray says, well, I've done everything I was supposed to do. I've, I've plowed under my cornfield. I've built this field. I've done everything I've been asked to do. And not once have I asked, what's in it for me? And Shoeless Joe says, well, what are you saying, Ray? And he says, well, what's in it for me? Well, you know, what, what was he getting out of it? Well, we can't look at it like that. We have to give the credit to God. Uh, we're doing it for God and for his purposes. Next, a servant is more concerned with ministry to others than anything else. That has to be the most important thing in our lives. That has to be the focus of our lives, doing good for others. Luke chapter 16, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. 
We've already talked about a couple times about this idea of having a foot in the kingdom and a foot in the world. You know, we can't have a foot in God's word and in God's kingdom, uh, working for God, and then a foot uh, still in the world and, and doing what we want to do. Uh, no servant can serve two masters, for either will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. We cannot serve God and mammon, or cannot serve God and man. So we, we can't have it both ways. We have to make a choice. And so we have to focus on what's most important and our ministry to others. As we've said before, Christ told us by serving others, by doing good for others, is the way to serve him. And so that has to be the focus. That has to be uh, our main concern. Uh, we have to be more concerned with that than anything else. Our seventh point is a servant serves with a spirit of humility. You know, some people, as we uh, kind of talked about just a moment ago, do things for the recognition. They do things for uh, the accolades and for the adulation and, you know, the pat on the back and, and all this recognition. A true servant does so uh, with a spirit of humility. You know, a true servant's going to serve not wanting the credit, not wanting to be recognized. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So when we serve others, do it in a, in a spirit of humility. Uh, understanding the, the real reason for that service. And of course, some of these points all kind of tie into this. You know, the real reason for our service is our service to God. And so by giving God the credit and understanding that that's our way to serve him, uh, then we're being pleasing to him. It's not about uh, getting our names in the paper or things like that. Uh, a lot of times people do things uh, serving others and do, it, do so anonymously. Uh, they may give money or they may do other acts of kindness and, and they don't want to be recognized. They don't want their name to get out there. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, Dale Earnhardt Sr., who was a NASCAR uh, driver, uh, real popular during the, the 80s and then 90s. And obviously was very successful, won seven uh, Winston Cup trophies, uh, was wealthy, uh, had, had plenty of money, obviously, because of all of his winnings and because of, uh, you know, some of the uh, other things that go along with that, you know, some of the sponsorships and, and all, and doing commercials and whatnot. Uh, but the story told of him, and this was after he, he passed away in the crash at the Daytona 500 back in 2001. Uh, there in North Carolina, Kannapolis, North Carolina, where he lived, there was a church that was trying to raise money to repave their parking lot. And they were doing, I think, bank sales or doing some different things, trying to raise money. And he stopped in, and of course they knew who he was when he pulled in, and asked him how much they needed. And I think it was $30,000 that they were trying to raise. Of course, this has been several years ago, but they're trying to get $30,000 to, to pave their parking lot. They're on the spot. He writes them a check and says, pave your parking lot. But he says, if you tell anybody where you got the money, I'm going to bring my dozer back in and I'm going to tear it up. So, you know, he gave that money, uh, not wanting the attention, not wanting the recognition, he was trying to serve others with a spirit of humility. So, uh, you know, uh, those, those kind of people who are doing things, trying to help others, not wanting the recognition, uh, you know, that, that's the attitude that, that we need to have, to have that spirit of, of humbleness and humility, not looking for the attention. A servant is a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Well, uh, we need to be careful that when we serve others uh, that we're looking to try to do so, again, in, in the right attitude, a spirit of humility, uh, looking to serve God, uh, looking to uh, make him the, the focus of our efforts uh, and, and taking care of others. Uh, but sometimes when we serve, uh, sometimes we, we, again, may not have the right attitude. Uh, sometimes in serving, with, there can be some, uh, some contention there. There may be some feelings that uh, don't always match up. Uh, there may be some... Uh, maybe some, some, some attitudes or maybe some, uh, you know, some personalities uh, that, that conflict a little bit. And, and we have to look to do whatever we can to try to avoid that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 says, A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient. And sometimes it's hard to be patient. Sometimes uh, it, it, it's, it's difficult to, uh, to be pleasant in all situations. But we need to be doing everything we can to, to not stir up trouble, to not try to not cause trouble, to not cause hard feelings, and to, to stir up these, these bitter feelings. Uh, we need to be pleasant. Uh, we need to be peaceful. And uh, we need to have the right attitude when serving others. We need to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Then finally, a servant is faithful to the ministry that they are given. 
And we've been given a responsibility as Christians to serve others. We've been given instructions on what we're to do uh, to serve others. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says, Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of in stewards that one be found faithful. So to be a true steward, to be a true servant, uh, we have to be obedient. We have to be faithful. We have to follow uh, those instructions that we've been given. Well, as servants of God, if we are Christians, if we are followers of Christ, you know, what, what responsibilities do we have? And we've talked in the last few weeks about opportunities to serve others. Of course, during this time of the pandemic and as people are maybe losing their jobs or people are, or are facing different situations, we've got opportunities to, uh, to try to help them, to serve them, and to do good for them. Uh, but we think of the big picture, however, as Christians, uh, our, our responsibility that Christ has given us in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, we're told to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We're to have a love, we're to have a concern for the lost souls around us. And so we have instructions to, as, as stewards, as, as servants of God, to teach those who do not know him, to teach those who are lost. We're told there that he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So we see that belief and baptism are necessary in order to be saved. Um, so that is the commandment, to go into the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. Now, are we doing that? Are we faithful to that responsibility? Are we faithful to that ministry uh, that we've been given? Well, those are nine characteristics, and, and perhaps you could think of others, and I'm sure there are others that could be included, but for time's sake, we'll limit it to those nine this, this morning for today's lesson. Uh, but hopefully last week, as we talked about seven motivations for being a servant, and then today talking about, the, uh, about these nine characteristics of, of being a servant, being a leader, hopefully it's given us some, some motivation to try to, to, to do better, to do more, to, to look to serve others uh, in different ways as we go forward uh, with our lives. And uh, obviously, as we said, during this, this time of, of crisis, uh, there's been opportunities to, to serve others, maybe some new opportunities. Sometimes maybe it was difficult because uh, maybe because of the stay-at-home restrictions or other uh, social distancing uh, requirements. You know, maybe it's not been as easy to do some things, and that's understandable. But hopefully, uh, good Lord willing, as these restrictions are being relaxed, as maybe we can kind of get back a little bit more towards our normal lives, uh, we recognize these opportunities and, and can take advantage of them. As we conclude this lesson this morning, let's think about some of the characteristics of Christ's mind. And of course, we've talked about uh, his example that he set as a servant to others. He came to this earth uh, not to be served, but to serve. And so what was, what was his mindset? What was his thought? What was, what was going on in his head uh, in setting this example? And so uh, here in these uh, first few verses of Philippians chapter 2, uh, let's, let's take a peek into Christ's mind and look at some of these characteristics. It says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Of course, this is summing up a lot of these uh, points that we've talked about the last couple of weeks. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought, uh, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. So here is the here is God's son, here is our king, our savior, the Messiah, coming to this earth you know, with no reputation. He's not trying to come here with all the fanfare and all of the, the, the adulation and, and all that, that would go along with being a, an earthly king, but he's taking the form of a bondservant, taking the, the, the form of a servant, and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So Christ came to this earth, to serve us. And his service took him all the way to the cross and to be nailed there and to give his life there on the cross to serve God's plan and to fulfill God's plan. So thinking about those characteristics and as we go on in this passage, therefore, because of his faithfulness, because of his service, because of his obedience, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. So we think about those characteristics and think about the example that Christ has set. So may I ask, how do I become a servant if you're not a child of Christ, if you're not already um, a member of, of the body? 
Well, you have to be obedient to Christ. You have to follow his word. First of all, Romans chapter 10, verse 17, uh, we're told that we have to, to hear the word. Okay? Faith comes by hearing. We have to believe uh, that which we have heard, Hebrews 11, uh, 1, 11, 6. We have to repent of our sins. We have to turn away from that sinful life. And we have to be willing to live a new life, obedient to God and to Christ. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Acts 8, chapter 37, we have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And he asks him, what hinders me to be baptized? And so Philip says, you know, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then he might and says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He makes that great confession, his belief that Jesus is the Son of God and is our Savior and came and shed his blood for our sins. And then the verse we looked at just a moment ago, you look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 through 20. Uh, you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 38, 1 Peter 3, 21, Galatians 3, 26, 27, many other verses uh, instructing us in order to be saved, we have to be baptized. And then finally, to live a faithful life. Uh, and, you know, just being saved is not enough. We have to continue in a faithful life. Uh, we can't just get saved and then all is well and forget and turn our backs on God. No. Uh, we're instructed that we have to continue living faithfully. All 27 books of the New Testament either have verses which specifically warn against falling from grace or have examples of people who fell from grace, people that were saved but turned their back on God, and because of that, they were lost. So the idea of uh, once saved, always saved, uh, every book in the New Testament teaches against that. So sadly, that is a uh, misconception uh, by many in, in the Christian world. Revelations 2 verse 10 tells us we must be faithful, we must be obedient to death in order to achieve that eternal life in heaven. So uh, we need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized, and we continue to live a faithful Christian life. And so those are all uh, just a, a few passages there. Uh, there's many others that uh, could, uh, could back up those uh, different steps of salvation. And for some of you watching today, maybe that's a little bit different than, than what you've been taught or what you've heard or what you've understood. Uh, again, we, we teach this uh, in a spirit of love, uh, in a spirit of concern for your soul. Uh, if you have questions or uh, would like to talk about these verses, I'd like to talk about this, uh, we would be happy to, to talk to you about it and to try to study with you and to see what God's Word says. Not, not what man says, not what some preacher or some uh, creed book, doctrine book teaches, what does the Bible say? I want to speak where the Bible speaks and then be silent when the Bible is silent. So uh, hopefully this lesson, again, has been an encouragement to you, looking at nine characteristics of a servant. Let's conclude the lesson uh, with a prayer. Father, as we are about to end this worship service this morning, again, thankful for the opportunity we have, thankful for the technology that's been provided, which enables us to meet together, uh, maybe not physically in person, but meeting together and in spirit, uh, as we uh, sing songs of praise to you, as we offer these prayers up unto you, as we uh, hear a portion of your word, Father, I uh, just pray that everything, again, that has been said and done here this morning has been pleasing and accepted in your sight. I'm so thankful for your love for us as, as your children, uh, love so great that you would put a plan in, in motion that, that Christ would leave the comforts of heaven and come to this earth, take on the body of mortal man, uh, to live his life, go about his ministry, showing us how to live our lives by example and serving others, doing good for others, and in so doing, Father, to serve you and then to give his life there on the cross through his death and the blood that was shed there could wash away our sins and give us a hope of eternal life in heaven with you someday, Father. We're so thankful for that love. It's hard for us to understand, hard for us to comprehend, but may we never take that for granted, Father. And may we always be thankful for it and, and look to live our lives each day in service to you and serving others. Father, we ask that you would forgive us when we sin, fall short, continue to bless us, guide and watch over us, Father. You know our needs. May we trust you, put our hope and our faith in you. Father, just ask for continued blessings. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Again, as we said a moment ago, if you have any questions, uh, we'd love to talk to you, to speak to you, to study with you. You can call our phone number here at the building. Uh, you can email us there at rsokcoc at gmail.com, or if you're watching live on Facebook, you can send a uh, message to the church at, uh, on Facebook Messenger. So uh, we'd love to speak with you if you have any questions, have concerns. Uh, we're uh, hoping and praying that uh, this has been beneficial to you. We care about you. Uh, we love you. And so thank you for joining us again this morning. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. God bless.